Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Alright, um, just open your Bibles to Isaiah 64. 53. Okay, so this is towards the end of the book of Isaiah, and then this is Isaiah basically continuing on with uh, basically after about 61, 62. His message to the nation of Israel becomes positive as opposed to what it had been with pretty much negative uh, and not only just prophesying their future uh, and also prophesying with regard particularly Messiah and then also judgment coming towards them but he is now at this point uh, in the theme of promises of God and in particular as far as how God is going to bless uh, Israel and then we'll see that later like in uh, chapter 66, 65 in particular. Uh, but here he cries out, and then this is something that is, I guess you could say, a prayer of Isaiah, is that uh, a request or a desire that God would come down and that he would uh, rend the heavens. And so, um, this, uh, again, now you're asking, okay, how does this pertain to the whole subject of revival and then uh, what we've been looking at. And so we're looking at kind of basically the phases just to review the outline again is that uh, when you see your need or you feel, you, you feel your need with regard to revival that you need God's reviving presence, you see, okay, there's got to be something more. So you start off uh, with just acknowledging the fact that there's something beyond where I'm at right now that I have necessity of. And then at that point, usually most people respond by seeking God, which is what we looked at last week, is that they go ahead and they out, uh, they go ahead, they go ahead and they uh, put effort to, okay, well, seek God as far as they know best. So they're responding to light that's been given to them, and so um, in their response to that light, God responds in turn to them. And then this is where we would see basically uh, I guess you can call it God coming down. Uh, now, most of this is not original with me. Um, uh, actually, most of this is from uh, Brother Van Gelderen. He just did a really good job. So I was like, okay, hey. But I amended to some degree for us here. But um, when you've sought God and then he responds and he actually, I guess you could say, comes down uh, in response to you or seeking him uh, this is what we see. Now, in his outline, he's speaking primarily corporately uh, of God's corporate manifestation uh, or his manifestation to people's corporate requests, but the thing is this still applies to a person individually, and that is that when you seek God's presence and you seek God, he will be, you, you know, he will be found of you. You seek him with your whole heart, and then he comes down and he manifests himself. So, God coming down, he explains it as this, uh, at the end of verse 1, is that um, the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Uh, he also speaks at the end of verse 2 that uh, the nations may tremble at thy presence. Uh, and then verse 3, that um, the mountains uh, flow down again at, at thy presence. And so, you could say... God coming down is his express spirit's manifestation of his presence. So it's in other words, it's, it's God manifesting his personal presence to you. Uh, now that obviously starts individually as you seek him, and then that would spread corporately as individuals gather together to seek his presence, and then he will come and manifest himself. And so you have God's manifestation, uh, which basically that's our need. Okay. In other words, we need God's presence. We need the acknowledge, not just to acknowledge the fact, okay, yeah, he's here, he's alive, but we need, I guess you could say, that special touch in our life from him so that we would step out. And we'll see this also. We see this primarily in the book of Acts, what we'll, we'll be looking at uh, when God manifests his presence in our life, which is us walking in the spirit. Um, what God does as a result of that which primarily is boldness and preaching the gospel, <laughs> uh, among other things, but that's primarily what you'll see. 
Okay, so uh, there's three dynamics that are involved here uh, with having God come down or God manifesting his presence. Uh, the outline calls for it says intercession for the present, and that is uh, basically right now. Uh, and that is, he's asking his question here, or his desire in verse 1 is that, Oh, that thou wouldest rent the heavens that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Okay, so, I know this is kind of silly, but like, what did he ask? I know we just read this question, but what did he ask specifically? Uh, that they would rent the heavens, that they would come down. They would come down. When? Uh, judgment. No, I didn't say why, I said when. Right here presently. Yeah, it's implied. Basically, he wants him to do it now. In other words, I want it. God. I want you now. I want you to come down now. He didn't specifically state now, but the implication, of the idea there is that. Good question. Do it now. <laughs> come down now. All right. So, um, first dynamic is the intercession for the present, and then that's basically you're calling out uh, for you want you want God you want God to come down, and then. Um, Note, uh, we'll look at this uh, verse 2 and 3, is that he says, as when the melting fire burneth, okay, that's in the manner in which he wants him to come, as far as that's, he's wanting God to manifest himself in that manner, uh, the fire that causes the waters to boil, and here's the reason why, uh, at least one of them, is this, uh, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Uh, and then when thou didst terrible things which we look not for, uh, thou camest down. All right. Um, so his his purpose is that he's basically asking on the behalf. He wants God's personal presence. You know, he he personally desires of God's presence. Uh, and beyond that, he also wants it. He's asking on the behalf of for the adversaries and for the nations that uh, that don't know God, so that they would tremble at His presence. Uh, which is kind of odd, but he'd be—he's—he's yeah, he's actually that's intercession, that's asking on the behalf of another. That's basically what an intercession is. Um, so first of the three dynamics is that he would intercede, or he's interceding, right? And then uh, for the present, for God's manifest presence, presently now, uh, and then what are indications? or what happens when God's presence comes. Uh, we see that it says, uh, mountains might flow down at thy presence. And then uh, obviously that he would be, uh, he would be manifest also. It says that thy name, uh, to make thy name known to thine adversaries and that the nations may tremble at that presence. Okay, so first is um, mountains moved. Mountains move, or mountains flow down. Mountains melted is that's how he's gonna he's gonna later describe it uh, in verse three. Or mountain, basically, mountains flowed, mountains slowed down, mountains moved. Um, you could say yeah, judgment, but what are usually mountains representative of? When we need faith, it's an obstacle, basically. Yeah. So. You have something that is great that would seem basically impossible, that naturally speaking is not movable. Nothing can be done about. At God's presence, it they float. They usually move. And um, that could be any number of things. I mean, go ahead. I've suggested that might be a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> it could be. Uh, it could be any number. Yeah. Um, but it's God, physically. God's the cause, though. So. Yeah. God. So, yeah. And the, and the volcano erupts, but the mountain. The mountain dissolves. So, I don't think that's possible. With regard to. Well, it's it be a volcano. It, oh. In other words, the volcano comes up, the mountain will go down. 
this illustration. It flows down in the lava. Well, when a volcano erupts, it kind of, it comes up. Like there are islands that have come up from volcano from being volcanic. Anyway, the lava lava area the, the lava could be a picture of the mountain melting, but it's a mountain. Yeah. The point being that it's illustrative of the fact that God moves that which is impossible to us. Okay, God's able to go ahead and make things that are humanly impossible, you know, simply impossible. So he's the one that is removing mountains. Uh, two, that uh, his presence would be known among the adversaries and in, uh, among the nations. Uh, so masses are moved. In other words, people respond to God in mass. Okay, and then we'll, that's where we're going to look at primarily in the book of Acts. Uh, just seeing God move in a great way. That's not to say that he couldn't uh, with us individually, but it starts with us individually and then it would spread corporately from that. Um, and then with regard to also that you mentioned um, that the nations may tremble at that presence. That's them acknowledging God for who he is. And that's literally, that. that's what glorifying God is. It's basically making him known as who he is. You're lifting him up. Uh, you know, if I be lifted up, I'll draw him in unto me, what Jesus said. And so what we have there is basically God known for who he is. Uh, and so God is glorified. So God's manifest presence uh, is able to move mountains, uh, move people, and then obviously glorify himself. So we need that. All right, and then uh, verse 3, okay, when thou didst terrible things that we look not for, uh, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. Um, verse 3, first word, when, what does that indicate? <laughs> I know that's a silly question. Past. Okay. So he's asking for something presently, and then he's referencing something in the past of God having done. He says, okay, when thou didst terrible things. So in other words, God's done this before. He's very capable of doing it again. So he looked, he had a present need, and he's asking God to act now, but he's looking for inspiration in the past as well. Uh, <clears throat> He's, uh, by the way, uh, not only just in Deuteronomy, but in, in Leviticus, and you can go through all of the Old Testament. And uh, even, well, I think right now, immediately, the first thing that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians, that we're told that uh, these things were written aforetime time for our learning and admonition that we should not, you know, lust after the things that children of Israel did. And so we learn from the past, and also that the landmarks that Israel set up and were not to be removed um, are primarily there so that when the children, this is God's specific statement towards them with regard to that, that when the children were to walk by and then they were to ask, they would tell them of what God had done. Previous victories, God's accomplishments through them, and those types of things. So God purposely <laughs> structured or designed certain things and people's lives for that reason so that it would be told and that it would be continually and we're to pass down from one generation to the next uh, with regard to God's wondrous works. We also see, especially you see this in the book of Judges, that there are generations that arose up that knew not the works of God or that the previous generation had failed to instruct the upcoming generation and as a result they had a disconnect there. And it wasn't that God still couldn't have worked in their generation, but it was a failure uh, to where the upcoming generation could possibly have potentially kept being kept from strain had they been instructed with regard to God's works. It actually lends, uh, well, okay. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right. When we fail, <laughs> to really study out and examine the character of God and 
if you think about it, I mean, beyond anything else, this is also a history book. We have God's record of his interaction with humankind since basically the beginning, which would say, okay, we're going on a conservative estimate. It'd be 6,000 years ago, but say, we'll, say we'll go back 8,000 years ago of human history of how God interacted with man. And then um, my fear or my trepidation to want to go ahead and trust God for whatever it is that he's commanded me to do or whatever he's given promise for, but I still am doubtful of, uh, is dissuaded and eliminated whenever I look into the word and I see, okay, well, he's done that before. He's done that with this person. I'm really not much different. So that, that increases my faith. That builds me. Anyway, so that, I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, rabbit trail. But they look for inspiration at the past with regard to God having worked. Now, go, book, uh, go to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts. We'll be here for a little bit. We'll start in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Uh, verse 41. Okay. Um, well, verse 37, just so we get the context. Verse 37. Uh, now, when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day uh, there were added unto them about uh, 3,000 souls. All right? So you got 3,000 people there at Pentecost that received Christ. Uh, turn over a chapter to chapter 4. Uh, and Okay, um, I'm sorry, the, well, start, start at verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of, uh, of the temple and, and the Sadducees came upon them, this is Peter and John, uh, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through, the, uh, through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and then put them in hold unto the next day, for it was about, uh, for it was now eventide. Uh, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Okay, so now you got 5,000 people. Uh, few, not, not much long after Pentecost uh, that received the word, that uh, believed on the Lord Jesus. Uh, chapter 5. Chapter Yeah, uh, well, we'll start at verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles, 
uh, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, there's no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Okay, so you have multitudes there. You no amount. You can't even really tell the amount, other than this. It was a big crowd. Acts chapter six. Okay, verse one. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, uh, there arose a murmuring of, uh, among the uh, of the Grecians against the Hebrews, uh, because the widows were neglected in the daily administration. Uh, so the, the number of the disciples was multiplied. So in other words, people that believed on the Lord and then wanted to follow, uh, that was multiplied. Okay, verse seven or chapter seven. Excuse me. You have opposition. That it something that we were told that from Jesus Himself. That if the world hated him, that they hate, they would hate us as well, and then Satan's not gonna just sit, you know, idly by or whatever. But we're again admonished by Jesus that uh, you know, fear not, you know, for He's overcome the world. So in other words, we though we are gonna face opposition, and though we're even told in Ephesians that uh, we're to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places and uh, that you know having done all to stand that that we're to be able to in order to be able to stand in the evil day uh, have the whole armor of God on us uh, there's going to be opposition that we'll face uh, chapter 8 is that The church was spread because of the persecution, <clears throat> and then it says, uh, verse one, that uh, they were scattered about through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And then we see also not just of the Ethiopian eunuch, but that just previous to where the Holy Spirit calls Philip to go speak to the Ethiopian, um, he says, uh, then Philip in verse five. Or excuse me, verse four. That uh, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. All right, uh, and then then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Note the response. Uh, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Uh, for unclean spirits, uh, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many. Uh, taken with palsies uh, that were lame were healed, and there was great uh, joy in that city. And then um, talks about Simon. And then verse 12, and then uh, when they believed Philip uh, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, they were uh, baptized both men and women. So you have basically the city of Samaria responding. Uh, it says exclusively of it that uh, that the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. All right, so you have basically the city of Samaria <laughs> being arrested, having their attention arrested with regard to the preaching, and many that believed there were baptized, and then they were joined into the church as well. Acts chapter nine. Uh, we see Paul's conversion. And then straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all they that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this uh, 
he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, uh, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. Uh, but Saul increased him more and more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that uh, this is very Christ. Then they um, they sought to kill him at this point. He sneaks out. He preaches. Then they, he goes to Samaria. And then verse 31, uh, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and uh, Galilee and Samaria and were edified uh, and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and uh, were multiplied. That's verse 31, uh, chapter 9. Acts chapter 10. I'll start at verse 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and, and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And then the word of God which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the word of all. Uh, that word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of these things, which he both did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, um, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And so, then uh, verse 44, skip down. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard. And then they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you have, if we look back at the beginning, it was Cornelius and the group that was with Cornelius, uh, which it wasn't really numbered as to how many, but it was, I suppose, obviously it's more than a handful that was with him. It was a group, a significant amount of group that not only was with him, but also, of, and then of the Jews that accompanied with Peter that came up and shared the gospel with Cornelius. So now on the Gentiles you see God blessing and then there was a multitude there unnumbered again. Uh, Acts chapter 11 literally, <laughs> literally we're basically going to go through every single chapter just about. Um, let me give a summary. Acts chapter 11 in Antioch a great number uh, a number, uh, much people were added. Acts chapter 12 is where James is martyred, and then that's opposition. But the word of the Lord grew, and then the church was multiplied there. Acts chapter 13, uh, basically almost the whole city. Now, beginning at something that of significance is beginning basically at chapter 13, working your way through the end of the book of Acts to chapter 28 is that when you read of the accounts of Paul preaching and the company that was with him preaching or the gospel being shared and then people coming to Christ, there's going to be opposition, but you don't really see much of what we would consider the signs of wonders that had been previously demonstrated with regard to... Um, not that salvation isn't supernatural. It is supernatural, but you don't see the supernatural manifestation of... Uh, I mean, you do see in a handful of instances uh, he calls blindness on that one man, and so boom, you know, he's blind. In uh, chapter 27, he's bitten with the that poisonous serpent that jumps out of the fire when he's warming himself in the island of Melita when they're stranded there, shipwrecked. And then, uh, you know, he, he's not harmed by that poisonous serpent, and then the, the barbarians that, as they're called, sitting there wondering, wow, okay, first they think, okay, you know, this guy's got to be really wicked because death is following him, and then all of a sudden it's like, he's not harmed, so this guy, they, they think, okay, he must be a god, he's from, you know, he's from the heavens, he's uh, some supernatural being that he's walking around, not being harmed by uh, poisonous serpents, uh, but what you see is a reduction of the, the supernatural manifestation of those types of things of what we would see, the signs and wonders. Um, but what you do see is, obviously, 
people being born again, opposition, multitudes obviously responding to the word of God. Uh, so you look at, again, God manifests, people are drawn to him. Okay? Not, not everybody obviously responds. It's a choice of the will, and we all have you know, a free will to choose whether or not we're going to respond to God or we're going to walk away from him. And that was another part of the lesson that I wanted to look at was that what makes the distinction or the difference is um, what I call brokenness. In Psalm 34, 18, Psalm 34, 18, Okay, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and that are, uh, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Okay, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. When God comes down and God manifests Himself to us, when He does a reviving work in our hearts, and we draw nigh to Him, uh, and He draws nigh to us. Uh, there's going to be an awareness of <laughs> uh, our sinfulness compared to his holiness. Uh, we see this in Isaiah 6. Go to Isaiah 6 real quickly. This isn't the only illustration of this, but this is one, uh, one of many. I think it's one of the best ones, honestly, but Isaiah 6. Um, chapter 1. Or verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he, did co he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And then one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God, uh, Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now here's his response to seeing this. Okay, mind you, up to this point, he's been called of God as a prophet to prophesy to Judah, basically to prophesy to the nation of their wickedness and of God's judgment that is befalling them. And so everything up to this point has been woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. Right? He sees God in all His glory uh, manifest, and here's his response. Uh, verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then we see the seraphim come, take a coal from off the altar, put it in his mouth, and he receives cleansing. And then we have his call following that. But his initial response in seeing God in his holiness and his glory, Woe is me. Woe is me. Revelation 1. Revelation 1. You start off in verse 9. It's a little lengthy, but I'll start there and I'm going to skip down to verse 17 because 17 is actually where his response is. We'll start at verse 9. I, John, uh, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 10 I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last uh, what thou seest write in a book and send it uh, unto the seven churches which are in Asia unto Ephesus unto Smyrna unto Pergamos unto Thyatira unto Sardis unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white like wool, 
uh, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet uh, like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And his, and his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was uh, as the sun shineth in his strength. Now here's his response. Mind you, he said he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. So he's walking with God. He's clear conscience. He's, you could, you know, for all intents purposes, all intents and purposes, you can say, okay, I'm right with God, and this is the Lord's day. I'm worshiping God. God basically manifests Himself to him, and is giving him a message. So he turns around and sees God in His glory, and here's his response. Uh, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I saw him and I fell at his feet as dead. Yeah? Fear gripped him. Now mind you, this is as he calls himself the apostle or the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? He leaned on Jesus' breast. He uh, was one of the three that was actually on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw Jesus transfigure himself before uh, with Moses and Elijah and where Peter was with him as well, and he wanted to build three tabernacles and to remain there. Uh, he was also the one that would have been tasked with taking care of Mary, Jesus' mom, after, or at, well, at the crucifixion when Jesus said, you know, uh, son, behold thy mother, and then mother, behold thy son. Uh, and so you would think, <coughs> out of all of them, you know, who would be the most comfortable? You know? But he sees, he sees, he sees God manifest in his glory, he falls at his feet as dead. Okay, uh, Job 42. Job 42. Yeah. Well, you know what? Keep your finger on 42. Go to chapter 1. Okay? Go to chapter 1. Uh, we'll start at verse 8. Technically, if you want, you, you really should read the first. We won't do it for lack of time, just because of lack of time. But you really should read the first five verses regarding Job as far as how he's described his character. But this is God's description, verse 8 of Job. Uh, and then the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Okay, that's God's personal first-hand description of Job, his assessment of what Job is like. It says he's perfect and upright. There's none like him upon the earth. Now he gives that description later on in chapter 2 as well. Um, and then go skip to verse, now, now go to uh, chapter 42. Chapter 40? 42. Uh, 42. We'll, we'll just start, chap, we'll start in verse 1. For, um, his actual response is going to be uh, verses 5 and 6 that we want to look at. But we'll start at verse 1 in chapter 42. It says, then Job answered the Lord. Now, mind you, okay, up to this point, beginning at, 40. what's that? That's chapter 40. What's that? No, 42 is what I want to look at. Oh. No, you're, okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. Verse 30. All right, so up to this point where we start off in 42, chapter basically is beginning at 38, God is going to ask continual rhetorical questions to him. He spends 38, 39, 40, and 41 asking just continual series of rhetorical questions. Job had not sinned with his mouth, but he was starting to get a bad attitude because his affliction is a prolonged thing. We actually have no clue as to how many weeks or months it could have been that he was in his physical condition of being with the boils and the sores from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot after having lost basically everything except for his wife. Um, and then just being in that pain in that state 
and then you have his three friends who come to him to console him and then uh, they challenge him with the fact that well God wouldn't do this to you unless you've sinned so this is a result of your sin and they're trying to convince him of the fact that hey you've sinned but he and clear conscience is arguing with him hey look I haven't I really don't know why I'm being afflicted I just know that I haven't sinned so this there's a uh, part of the reason for the whole account it being preserved is so that God could correct our thinking uh, with regard to that, toward, with regard to affliction, and correct their thinking. But also, um, you know, so up to this point, he's asked a continual series of rhetorical questions, and now we see we're getting ready to see Job's response to everything here. He says, that, "Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that." Uh, no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? I therefore have uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand thee of thee, and declare thou unto me. Okay, now here's, here's his reaction to seeing God or getting to know God for who he is in the light of his affliction. Uh, he says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Right? <laughs> That's it. We see a common theme here. He sees God for who he is. You know, after being asked a continual series of rhetorical questions in his affliction. And he says, I, I I know you for who you are. I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Okay. Isaiah cried out, Woe is me. Um was the other one I just put down? Uh, we had um, John. Oh, John. Yeah, John fell at his feet as a dead man. Um, when we see ourselves in the light of God's holiness, I mean that should be our natural response, and that I believe is key or crucial to our being able to continue. Uh, if we, in light of seeing ourselves. Because uh, God says His promise there in verse thirty, uh, chapter thir uh, Psalm thirty four eighteen is that He's nigh to them that are of a broken and contrite heart. Uh, you know He's not going to despise those. Uh, and when we break in light of His holiness, and then we yield to what He calls us to, then we move forward and we progress. Because if you think about it. Not everybody that was at Pentecost believed. Only 3,000 did. Were there more than 3,000 there? Well, sure. The few days after, you have 5,000 that responded, but not all that were there responded. There were some. If you look in Acts 17, when Paul preached at Mars Hill, he his state will we'll look through real quick. He says, and you know, and some believed. Some said, okay, we're who you again, and then others just mocked and went away. So not, obviously not everybody responds. It's a, it's a free it's a free will choice. It's not going to force anybody to follow him. But the fact remains that we break when we see ourselves in the light. If we if if we break, if we choose to break, we choose to be contrite to break and then yield to what he commands and to what he leads. We'll see revival. That's how we continue on from the point of asking God, seeking God. And then him coming and responding. Now he will respond when we seek him with our whole heart. He responds, but that's the key. When we see ourselves in the light, and you know, there's a contrast there. Break. Okay, and I hope I'm not. <laughs> I'm being clear with that. We break. In other words, you can choose to harden yourself and say no, nah, and walk away. But you're not going to be able to be in a revived state. You're not going to have the blessing of God. You're not going to have the power of the Spirit upon your life. Those that do uh, are the ones that are broken, contrite heart, and they break. All right. Any questions? I know it's kind of, I combined the two into one is what I did there. Uh, but that's key and crucial, I believe, that not only just seeing revival, experiencing revival, and then going from the personal to be able to affect people appropriately. And God is still very capable of working. 
Uh, the key is, are we seeking him? And then two, do we believe that he's he's gonna he's he's gonna he's gonna promise, or that he's he's gonna do us promise? All right. Any questions? All right. Guess now we're dismissed.